Gene expression has to be very carefully controlled inside of cells. There's no need to take all of the massive quantities of DNA that we have, all of the different genes that we have, and just continuously make polypeptides and proteins from every single one of them. So we have to control gene expression, and there's multiple ways that this is going to be done. First off, some genes are going to be expressed all the time. So that means that they are constantly transcribed and constantly translated. We do get a polypeptide from them all of the time. Other genes, however, we need to be much more selective with. So some genes are only transcribed, only translated in response to some type of specific stimuli. And this could be in response to communication that they received from another cell. This could be in response to specific environmental conditions. This could be in response to some particular pathogen attack. So if we talk about ways that cells do control their gene expression, one of the first ones to talk about is what we call quorum sensing. Quorum sensing is a really interesting process, really, where cells secrete chemicals, so the chemicals leave the cell, and then those chemicals are going to be detected by neighboring cells. And the idea here is that when enough chemicals are detected, the cells will know that there is a great abundance of them. And once they realize that they're so abundant or that their population has reached a certain level, then they will be able to do certain things and respond to that kind of big numbers. In some cases, this is when a particular bacteria might decide to mount some type of attack against a host organism. So they might lay kind of dormant until numbers get prevalent enough. So here you can see in this picture that the first two cells, um, they are not um, expressing these particular genes and that's why we see the little X there. The little green structure is showing us the RNA polymerase. There's only a few chemicals on the outside so again they're not doing anything. But once we get a lot of cells there are lots of little chemicals floating around and that sensing of chemicals, the fact that there's a bunch of them there is going to cause these to actually decide to transcribe that gene. So we can see now the RNA polymerase is bound to the DNA and it's going to go and start making RNA molecules. That's quorum sensing. Another way that gene expression can be regulated is through the use of operons. This is something that's going to be unique to prokaryotes, and operons are composed of a single promoter that controls the transcription of multiple genes. When we're talking about promoters, promoters are the instructions for when to transcribe genes. And in this case, it's one control region for multiple genes. So here we have an example of an operon. You've got your promoter, your instructions there, and then you've got four different structural genes here, one right after the other. So number one, two, three, and four would all contain instructions for making different polypeptides. So our operons, they work in two different ways. We have what are called inducible operons, and then we have repressible operons. With the inducible operons, these are going to be ones that are not typically transcribed. So normally we are not going through and actually producing RNA from these genes. And they must be activated in order to get RNA produced. So there are certain molecules that are called inducers. Inducers um, basically signal to the cell that go, now you want to actually produce RNA from this gene. Some operons are what we call inducible operons. These are going to be ones that are not typically transcribed. So in other words, we're not typically producing RNA from these sequences. And instead, these are going to basically stay dormant until there is some type of molecule, which we call an inducer present, and it will activate or kind of turn this on. If we look at an example, this is what we call the LAC operon, which is just one example of an inducible op operon. And if we look at the parts here, we've got the promoter here. That, again, is where the RNA polymerase binds. But we have another sequence here, which is shown here in blue, and that's the operator. And the operator is kind of like a roadblock um, in this whole process. It's something that we have to be able to get through if we're going to actually get transcription. So for the inducible ones, they are typically in the off position. And the reason that they're in the off position is that there is a molecule named a repressor, 
and the repressor is going to bind the operator and block transcription. And by block transcription, it is like a road, roadblock. It sits in the way of RNA polymerase. So even if RNA polymerase binds to the promoter, then the RNA polymerase cannot move forward because the repressor is sitting in the way. So in this manner, we're not going to get any RNA produced. Now, if we happen to have an inducer present, inducers are going to flip the switch. They're going to turn this to on. And what the inducer does is it actually binds to the repressor. So if you look right here, the inducer binds to the repressor, which causes it to come off of the operator, and now the roadblock is removed. And if the roadblock is removed, notice that the RNA polymerase is now actually going through and it's actually making the RNA molecule. And if we get the RNA molecule, then we expect that we are going to get some polypeptides from this particular instructions, from this particular set of instructions. So those are the inducible operons. If we look at the repressible operons, with the repressible operons, they function pretty much just the opposite. Um, in this case, the repressor has to be activated. So if we look at this one, um, in this one you can see you've got a promoter for the RNA polymerase to bind to, you've got an operator there, um, nothing is actually on the operator right now. So in this case, basically transcription is happening. As a default, transcription is happening. Now, if we have a repressor produced, the, re the repressor is going to go and it's going to bind to the operator sequence. So the operator sequence is always something that the repressor can go and it can actually bind to, and if it binds, it creates a roadblock. So this one, you can see it binding there, sitting in the way. If it is actually sitting in the way, transcription stops. This one here is showing us an example of kind of how it all works together inside the cell. The genes in this operon are meant to help the cell produce tryptophan, which happens to be an amino acid. But if it becomes really abundant, then it can activate the repressor. So notice that this repressor has to be bound to the blue before it can bind to the operator. So what this means is that if the product gets really high and starts to build up, it will actually turn off its own synthesis which means that the supplies of the product will start to drain, and when they drain, eventually this one will get used as well, which means repressor is inactivated, it comes off. So what it's doing is it's balancing supply and demand. If we don't have tryptophan, then we keep producing these genes that will help us make it. If we have an abundance of it too much, then we shut this process off so that we quit producing the molecules, the enzymes that are gonna make the tryptophan. So that's um, a repressible operon. Here's just a quick summary table of the two main types of operons, the inducible ones and the repressible ones. Inducible operons tend to um, most commonly be associated with catabolic processes. So these are processes where we're actually taking apart molecules to release energy. Um, and this is also for the production of virulence proteins. The repressible operons, these tend to be for anabolic pathways. So this would be for pathways that are making things. So notice that the ones that are actually making stuff, we're gonna leave them on pretty much all the time as a default, and then we turn them off if we get too much product at the end. A third way that we can regulate gene expression is with the use of RNA molecules. So RNA molecules, can actually be regulatory molecules. They can regulate transcription of polypeptides. And we have three main types of RNAs that do this. We have what we call microRNAs, small interfering RNAs, and then we also have what we call riboswitches. So the microRNAs, these are going to function by either promoting the degradation of an mRNA molecule or sometimes they bind to it and they actually kind of cover it up so that the ribosome can't see it. So if they hide it from the ribosome, the ribosome will not actually be making polypeptide from it. That's the micro ones. The small interfering RNAs, these are small double-stranded DNA. For the small interfering RNAs, these are small double-stranded RNA molecules. 
they are going to bind specifically and target certain mRNAs for degradation. So when they bind to an mRNA molecule, it will actually cause that molecule to get cut into itty bitty pieces and ultimately be taken apart. The third group, the riboswitches, these change shape in response to environmental conditions, environmental cues, and when they change shape, they can either increase or decrease translation. So they can actually work in either direction. The first two, they are decreasing overall gene expression, or what we would say is decreasing production of a particular polypeptide. If we talk about mutations, mutations are changes in the nucleotide base sequence of a genome. So these, um, most commonly, these are going to be random changes in the DNA. And these random changes in the DNA, um, they are altering the blueprint to make different molecules that are going to function inside the cell. So if we look here at the top, we have a normal DNA sequence, and you can see that that is going to be transcribed into an RNA molecule, an RNA sequence. And we have to remember that the purpose of RNA is for this ribosome to use it as instructions to make polypeptide. So we've got DNA sequence, it gets copied into RNA, and then we make a polypeptide. The problem with mutations typically is that if you change the DNA, you are also going to change the RNA that's made from it. And if you change the RNA, you may have different instructions and the ribosome is going to build something different at the end. So here we have there's just three different consequences that can happen if we have a mutation, a change in the DNA, that happens in a gene. So one possible change that we can get is what we call a silent mutation. And here we can see that there was a change. So notice here we have a G and it should have been an A if we're matching it to this one up here. But on that genetic code table, there is some redundancy. We had 64 codons, but there were only 20 different um, amino acids that they coded for. So what that means is that sometimes you have three letter combinations. Those combinations are different, but they're both specifying the exact same thing. A silent mutation is just that. When the codon is different, and so here's the different, um, let's see, this was the first one. So here's the different codon. So there it's UUU, here it's UUC. Either way, the ribosome still grabs the phenylalanine, which is the PHE. And the protein gets made the same way. That means there's going to be no effect on the cell. It's not going to be harmful at all. The next one is what we call a missense mutation. And with a missense mutation, basically now when the ribosome looks at the codon, so if we go up here and we look at this one, it's GCA. This one happens to be um, GGA. And if we look up this codon, it now codes for a different amino acid than the original up here. That's a missense mutation. With a missense mutation, you are changing one amino acid from what it should have been. In the end, it might not be a big deal. That protein may still be able to function. In other cases, it's a very big deal, and we might have a protein that's not able to function at all. The very last one um, is going to be if the codon, in this case, we're looking at this one, UAU, it gets changed to UAA, and now the ribosome looks at that and it's actually going to see stop codon. And when it sees stop codon, it basically stops, it lets go of everything. And so at that point, we would have a much shortened um, protein at the end. If it's only shortened a tiny bit, but it's still got the majority of the structure there, it might still function. But if um, we do have it really, really short, then it's probably going to be missing the vast majority of its overall structure probably not going to function very well inside the cell. So this one, perfectly fine, no problem at all. These two can be bad. Whether they're bad or not really depends on the specific region and the specific protein that did get altered. So how do these mutations happen? What's going to cause them? Well, mutations can occur naturally during the normal life of an organism, and that does happen. We call these spontaneous mutations. A lot of those spontaneous mutations are just errors that happen maybe during the overall DNA replication process. It's an awful lot of DNA to copy millions, billions of nucleotides, and that has to be copied every single time we produce new cells. 
So we can certainly get some errors, um, mutations that happen just on their own. But there's also some things called mutagens, which can cause errors or problems in the DNA. So mutagens, we think of them as different chemicals that alter the DNA. If we look at some different mutagens, um, one mutagen is what we call ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation is going to be radiation that energizes electrons, and when it energizes these electrons, they tend to leave their orbit. When they leave their orbit, they cause ions to form, and that's where the name ionizing radiation comes from. So they create ions, and then these ions can react with DNA structure. And when they react with DNA structure, they can cause alterations to the DNA structure, which ultimately can be very damaging, and they can cause the DNA to not function properly. So this um, ionizing radiation, it can cause physical breaks actually within the DNA and the chromosomes, in addition to just causing alterations in the DNA structure. We also have what we call non-ionizing radiation. Non-ionizing radiation is not going to create ions, but it can still alter the DNA structure. So this one, as we see here, it's causing adjacent pyrimidine bases to actually react with each other, hydrogen bond with each other, um, and they form what we call a dimer. And so here you have two T's that decide to hydrogen bond to each other rather than hydrogen bond to the two A's that they're across from. So that makes that particular region of DNA difficult to use. Other types of mutagens. We have nucleotide analogs, which mimic normal nucleotides, so they look like normal nucleotides. And the problem is that when DNA is being replicated, they are grabbed up and they are incorporated into the new DNA that's being made. And so they look like the normal nucleotides, but they don't function like the normal nucleotides. So it makes it difficult for that DNA to continue to be used properly. These can inhibit normal replication enzymes, so they can function as kind of a roadblock and kind of jam everything up when the replication enzymes try to go through and actually um, replicate that particular region of the DNA. And they can also sometimes be used as antiviral and anti-cancer treatments. And one of the reasons why these types of mutagens can be used for that is that um, viruses and then also cancer cells tend to replicate really fast. So they tend to be performing much higher levels of replication than your typical standard cell would actually be performing. So in that way, you're kind of selectively um, targeting those rapidly reproducing um, cancer cells, and viral microbes. If we talk about the frequency of mutations, this frequency is kept really quite low overall. And this is due to two things. The DNA polymerases themselves are able to proofread their work. So as they are making new DNA, they are double checking it and making sure that they did it the right way. If they make errors, they try to fix them right then. But then second, we have repair enzymes that kind of come along behind DNA polymerase or they look at the DNA all of the time and they check for errors. And if errors are located, are identified, they're going to fix those. So here we have a look at that. We've got an example of non-ionizing radiation, which in this case is visible light. It hits the DNA and it causes one of those dimers between the pyrimidine bases. So we've got this buckling out of it, and then we've got a repair enzyme here in the blue that you can see is actually gonna take that, and it's going to cut it out, and it's gonna repair that particular region. We have different types of damage that can occur. We have different types of repair enzymes that are gonna go through and fix that. So you can see there is um, what we call dark repair. There is base excision repair where we cut out a base or two. There's also what we call mismatch repair. Um, very similar enzymes that are going to be functioning with all of them, but the idea is to cut out the damaged area, and then we want to fill it in, and we want to seal the gaps, um, usually using some ligase enzymes to seal the individual DNA fragments together. Now, occasionally the DNA damage is going to be so severe, so elaborate, that the cell has to take a much more 
um, elaborate response to it. Um, this is what we call the SOS response, and we're not going to go into the detail of that right here, but just know that sometimes it does require a much more elaborate response than just a few enzymes going and repairing a few regions in the DNA.